Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Now, you might notice that the uh, books we're covering here today are not what I pre-sold last time and don't seem to be next up uh, in the timeline or anything. I'll tell you what happened. I had actually recorded the first three in this next block and I got to this point where I started realizing we've got a lot of overlap fourth edition is coming up pretty soon and Olav does not have very much fourth edition and there are a lot of things that are kind of switching between and so I thought well I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything I'm gonna go ahead and get all the fourth edition books that I know about and start kind of uh, organizing some of them while I was doing this I realized uh, that the Orc King by Salvatore the first of the transitions trilogy actually takes place in 1372, which we have already left long in the dust. But, you know, on Olav, it says that it starts there and it ends in like 1478 or whatever, sometime far into fourth edition. I knew that all three of the books had, uh, the transition books had King at the end of the title, and I didn't really pay much attention to the fact that Pirate King ends way before the Orc King. I just assumed that was their order. So here's the thing with Orc King. It has like a, um, a fairly short prologue and like literally a page and a half epilogue that take place in 4th edition, 1470 or so. It's, it, I think it says it's about 100 years later. But everything else, you know, I mean, 320 out of 340 pages uh, take place in 1372. So I totally understand why Olav categorized it ending in the 1470s, but, you know, to me it's like taking a look at a book that has a prologue that happens in 500, but most of it happens in 1372, you're going to categorize it as a 1372 book. And and really everything that's in the prologue and epilogue just serve as kind of teasers for what's coming up in 4th edition, I think. You know, it talks about the rise of the Aboleths, a few other things, but it doesn't really spoil anything uh, big. The, the one thing that it does spoil is the ending of the book, and that seems kind of frustrating. This was one of Salvatore's that I read uh, overall rather than skimmed. I, I, I'd say it was about 60-40, which um, compared to how little I cared for uh, the, the Hunter's Blades trilogy, uh, quite a, that's quite a bit, you know. But um, here's the thing. A, a lot of really fun stuff, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff that I, I found intriguing. You know, we have um, uh, Wolfgar kind of leaving the group and... Uh, it seems like he's leaving the group to go take care of Coulson, uh, but then that doesn't quite go as planned, though it's pretty straightforward that, you know, that, that could have been its whole book in and of itself, and I'm glad that it was just a subplot, but I was a little shocked at how straightforward it was. Cadbury is wounded throughout this entire book, and so is really just an ancillary character. Um, they think they find Gauntlegrim, but of course it's not actually Gauntlegrim. My main issue with this book is that there are so many fun little characters like Jack the Gnome and uh, just all sorts of crazy little plots going on, but the main thrust of this whole plot is King Obold, Ob -ob Obold, whatever, is kind of getting tired of war and realizing that there's not much point to it. Brunor wants to gain vengeance for all the deaths, etc., 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 and it's this kind of uh, upcoming clash uh, between Obold and, and people in his retinue who want to continue the war, and Brunor, who doesn't necessarily want to continue the war, but he feels he's been slighted, so he wants to continue that. But because of the prologue, we know that it ends in a truce, and so it felt kind of... I guess it felt like a a bit of a shaggy dog story, you know. Um, sometimes I, I felt like I was just reading to find out if anybody would die because I know that, that through this uh, trilogy, some characters are going to die. It got a little frustrating at times, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not a bad story and it, it's not one of Salvatore's more 
really adult stories, but it does show his adeptness for juggling a lot of different plot lines and making a lot of different characters feel very unique. It just kind of felt like it was about 150 pages too long because it was like, well, we know where this is going. You know, I felt like the truth should have happened much closer to the middle of the book and more of it should have been about the kind of uncomfortableness of two cultures who hate each other and were at war trying to live in harmony rather than, will they or won't they make a truce? Well, we know they do. You know, we we knew that from page seven or so. You know, I think you can kind of pull off like a book where you know it's going to end in war, watching things collide and not work out, et cetera, et cetera, and, and it finally ends in war. I don't think it's possible to kind of do the opposite. And maybe Salvatore wanted to do that as kind of an experiment. I don't think it worked. Um, still not one of the worst Drizzt books uh not not horrible overall, and we have a lot of characters that I'm kind of curious to see if more happens with them. So that's really all I had to say on that. Uh, I didn't want to do an entire <laughs> episode just with that book because I knew that I wouldn't have that much to say on it. So one of the other things that I started doing is I went back and decided to go through, uh, I am now reading through the anthologies as well, and I'll just start throwing some of them in there. The uh, the kind of nice thing about them is that they take place everywhere, uh, timeline-wise. So I'm just going to go through the first two really fast here because there are so many stories it's kind of difficult to uh, uh, to pinpoint any in particular. I'll tell you any that I thought were particularly good or bad. Realms of Valor, that's the first one. Elminster and the Mage Fair, 1355. Ugh, Elminster. Lord of Low Hill, 1356 by Douglas Niles. Everything is very exciting with lots of exclamation points. It's a character from the Moonshade books, a halfling, and I dug the story enough, so that was kind of fun. I got to get a little piece of the Moonshade books. One Last Drink from 892 uh, by Christy Golden, a little Ravenloft crossover. I did not realize that Jander Sunstar who's the star of the first Ravenloft book, actually showed up in uh, some Forgotten Realms stuff. I thought he was just, you know, uh, uh, an FR character created just for that novel, but that was kind of cool. The Bargain by Elaine Cunningham, 1362. Danilo and Erlen doing Harper things. But kind of fun to see some of these old people, not old people, but these uh, characters we haven't seen in a while. Again, um, haven't read anything by them in like uh, over a year uh, doing this. Patronage by David Cook, 1362. Kind of a coda to the Horse Lord's book. Thought that was cool. A Virtue by Reflection by Scott Sienson, 1353. Mermine Lull, Cat Detective. King's Tear by Mark Anthony, 1360. Standard Evil Wizard Fair. The Family Business by James Lauder, 1335. Uh, kind of an Image Comics character. Um, it was a Shadowhawk and Azun. Grandfather's Toys by Gene Rabe, 1362. What the hell? This did not feel like Forgotten Realms at all. Odd little story. Curse of Tegea by Troy Denning, 1360. Kind of a messed up Beauty and the Beast story. Troy Denning, always fun. Dark Mirror by Salvatore, 1357. More fun with racism, as if you didn't get that enough in the Drizz stuff. And let's really quickly look at Realms of Infamy. Again, just... Bam, 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 right through these. So High a Price by Ed Greenwood in 1334. Oh, it's the Beholders and Zentrum, but uh, really, it's it's Elminster. The More Things Change by Cunningham. Um, it, it goes up through 1390, which is kind of crazy. Um, Elaith, an, an odd little slice of life tale. Nothing uh, really happens. You just get some bits filled in. Interesting. Um, and a lot of these don't have dates, uh, so I'm just going to kind of uh, guess at them. The Meaning of Lore by Barb Hendy. In the story, 902 is considered more recent than archaic, so probably at least 1200 date-wise, that's my guess. Kind of a weird play on the Twilight Zone episode, Time Enough at Last. Raven's Egg by Elaine Bergstrom. Another Twilight zone story, uh, Worst Enemy, uh, that, that sort of theme. Third Level by R.A. Salvatore, 1341-ish, a 14-year-old Artemis slice of life. It was kind of fun. Bloodsport by Christy Golden, no clue when. More Jander, woo! 
Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I I enjoyed Vampire in the Mist. I, I I honestly don't remember it, but it's it was exciting for me to see that Jander shows up in this stuff. Gallows Day by David Cook. Pinch from King Pinch here. Still don't care about him. A Matter of Thorns by James M. Ward. Killer Plants. Stolen Spells by Denise Vitola. Interesting little revenge tale. The Greatest Hero Who Ever Died by J. Robert King. An odd little tale involving dead children and puppet skulls. Twilight by Troy Denning. Weird creation myth and giants thrown in there. The Walls of Midnight by Mark Anthony. Zentrum Initiation Hijinks. Uh, I'm guessing around the 1350s. And Ringing of Hands by Jane Cooper Hong. Like 50 twists and turns for one simple point to be made. Thieves' Honor, 1367, by Mary H. Herbert. Taza the Horse Thief and Her Wacky Adventures. Laughter in the Flames by James Lauder. Almost like an anti-Ring of Winter tale. Plus, special appearance by Sarek. Vision by Roger E. Moore, uh, the great James Bond actor, I suppose. Goblin point of view craziness. Yeah, so... Not much stuck out to me here as exceptional, maybe Denning's story in Realms of Valor. The, um, and, and I really liked uh, Louder's story in Realms of Infamy and, and the Jander stuff was just fun. The main thing, and I said it in here, it was just really fun to see a lot of these characters who, you know, I'm used to them in the larger stories and I haven't read them in a while. It was fun to see little bits and pieces of them that I hadn't seen before, and it had been a while since I had read them. You know, I don't necessarily want to go back and reread, uh, say, like the Azure Bond stuff, but if those characters show up in one of these uh, uh, anthologies, that will be really fun, and, and that would be a nice little way to get a reminder of them. Uh, as I say, I'll, I'll just kind of throw them in here. Um, I'm probably just going to kind of read them in the background here and there when I have a chance. Um, not really in any particular order. But yeah, when I get one done, I'll just throw it in with whatever I'm reading and we will talk about it then. Uh, again, just kind of zoom through them like this because I don't think there's any really good way to go through them in any depth without it taking like 50 minutes. So... If anything that you hear there sparks your interest, feel free to look it up. These, of course, are not Kindle-ready, I, I don't believe, which is a little weird. Um, not sure why they did that. In any case, this means that I now have uh, four done for this block, which is a little odd. And one of the things I mentioned in here is I'm going to start saying when I recorded things. So this was May 20th. Coming up next, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what's next, actually. <laughs> I forgot what's coming up next but we'll uh, we'll get into that soon here and um i will catch you later uh for right now this is michael t bradley realms remembered <laughs>